everyone. It's Gordon Einstein. I am broadcasting, or I should say recording live. Uh, it's live at the moment, at least from snowy Kiev. It used to be much more snowy yesterday. Now it's a little bit snowy. Uh, this is a rebranding of my prior show, which was Crypto Wednesdays. And now we're MENA Innovation, the Middle East and North Africa. And what better way to start off a MENA discussion by completely ignoring MENA and going straight to Ukraine? Why? Because I've got a chance to speak with a very good friend of mine and his partner. So we're just going to launch right now. Uh, I'm going to ask my guests to introduce themselves. And then we're, we're going to be talking about their exciting new project, Allbridge. So Andre, uh, please just give us your give us name, rank, serial number. And then we'll, you know, we'll introduce your uh, fellow guests. And we'll just kind of have a nice organic talk about the two of you and your brand new project. So please go okay. ahead. Thank you so much for inviting. I'm Andre from Allbridge. I'm also in Kyiv right now, actually same as Yuri. And for some reason, in, instead of meeting personal, we all are in three separate locations. It sounds, but, it sounds, like, a, it sounds like, you know, the, the war is about to start and we're all like in bunkers. We, we are decentralizing the whole thing, right? Oh, good answer. There you go. Perfect. And uh, what we do, and I hope that Yuri will help me more on the technical part of that, is we breach assets and we help the liquidity to be transferred between different blockchains. And what is unique about Allbridge is that our core, our technical expertise allowed us to actually bridge EVM chains to known EVM chains, which is rarely in the field. We currently support 10 chains. We hope to double this number, I think in the next half of year including adding the support for Casper. Gordon, by the way, you probably want to speak more about that particular side, as long as sure. you are the member of the advisory board. And we launched uh, our bridge in July in 2021. And since July 2021, we processed more than 5 billion worth of liquidity, which I think it is quite an impressive number. That's fantastic. Now, but Let's introduce Yuri also, and before we get, to, we're going to talk about, about Allbridge a lot, but I want to get, once you both introduce yourselves, I want to get sort of your backgrounds, because I've had the pleasure of knowing you for several years, and I'm happy to get to know Yuri. Uh, Yuri, please join us and say hello and say a little bit about yourself, and we'll dive in. Sure, sure. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Yuri, uh, CTO at Allbridge, and yeah, I rarely talk about such exciting stuff as Andre does. Uh, what I do is more technical, uh, but I'm happy to answer all your questions. Um, yeah, what we do is we bridge chains, we bring liquidity from one chain to another, and we actually, yeah, we build bridges. And um, yeah, concerning my background, uh, I've been in tech for more than 20 years in blockchain since, well, I'm quite late to blockchain party, since uh, 2017. Uh, but yeah, I've lived through one crypto winter. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've been talking, working on various blockchain projects mm -hmm. on different scales for all these past four years. And yeah, I'm very excited with what we've got at Allbridge right now. Uh, Fantastic. Yuri, where are you from? I'm from Kiev. I'm from Kiev. Uh, okay. Born and raised. Born right, and did you go to school here? Sure, sure. Actually, I'm like I'm currently sitting in my office, uh, like a couple of hundred meters from 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 place I went to school. Uh, so yeah, Kiev is my home. I'm briefly. Uh, yeah, of course, currently we are all working with different companies all around the world. And like the world is much smaller than it was 20 years ago. Uh, so yeah, basically Kiev is right now, it, it's it's on a world map on the, if we're talking about IT services, about software development, about blockchain. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here and it, it's good to be here. Yeah, Kiev is fantastic. I, I had the pleasure of my first time coming here, I think it was 2014. And I've been here probably 25 times. And it, to see it, 
it was, it was already on its way, I think, to becoming a tech hub then, but it's really blossomed, especially in the blockchain space. I mean, obviously, IT outsourcing in general and development in general, but it's just, it's, I think it's the, one of the main nexuses of crypto and blockchain development in the world. And it's, it's kind of neat to see that happen. A lot of it's happened post my dawn, uh, I think. It's just to embrace that new governance model. There's a lot of enthusiasm going on. But you mentioned, it's interesting, you mentioned you came to blockchain as you put it, relatively late. Um, I think you're still early compared to some other people, but you know, here you are a technical guy. If, if, you, if you've been doing in this field for 20 years, what was your, what was your technical background before blockchain? Well, it was all over, basically. Uh, um, like I started with, uh, with database uh, administration and programming, then I moved to mobile devices. So, I remember Palm OS, uh, Windows Mobile, all those stuff. Uh, then Android, then iOS, iPhones, then web, uh, then backend. So like basically, I, I knew a lot of everything, uh, a bit of everything. And uh, this, this actually, this helps me work with developers uh, and, and manage projects uh, because yeah, I, I can speak their language. I'm not like if whatever they do, I know what they're doing. Uh, so this is, makes me in disadvantage if, if I would be a developer myself, because mm -hmm. if you know a lot, you don't know uh, very, <laughs> yeah. That does not give you opportunity to like to dive deeper into uh, mm -hmm. into the technologies, uh, but currently I'm focusing on on the blockchain and specifically on smart contracts uh, because like I very much like the expressiveness of smart contracts because uh, like, you know hundreds a couple of hundreds lines of code uh, basically you have a, a an application uh, which will serve uh, millions of people and uh, handle like billions of dollars liquidity and like. That's that's very interesting for me, and uh, that's why I yeah, there are developers working for with us and who are writing smart contracts. But I will always be the one who says the final word because yeah, sure. I, I consider all the smart contracts my children basically. I don't tell it to my children. I have three of them, and they're beautiful. Uh, I was gonna say don't. I think you're gonna say don't tell it to your wife, but okay. <laughs> oh yeah, my 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 wife knows. Or she knows about that the kids. Okay, oh, that, that's okay. Um, what, what was the first moment when you had your sort of crypto or blockchain epiphany? What 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 swung you into awareness and made you go into this field deeply? Oh uh, well, I think it was uh, uh, first time I get to know Ethereum uh, because yeah, Bitcoin is was okay. Uh, it was something mysterious before I uh, understood what's going on. But at the end, it's, it's shockingly simple. Uh, but then uh, with Ethereum and Ethereum virtual machine and the ability to write smart contracts, like the, the possibilities are endless there. So yeah, that was like basically, uh, and when I understood the fact that basically smart contracts is, is nothing but the database and the code so i remembered my sure. background in database development when i was writing stored procedures in databases basically joining the data and the code so it's basically what i did and i struggled with transactions back then because databases support transactions but it's not like blockchain transactions and like when you handle financial stuff on the blockchain it's well sometimes it's not easy but at least you you trust uh, you trust in the uh, environment where you run this code and and right. where you store the data. So that was like a great thing, like a pivotal moment for me. I think uh, that's fantastic. Um, and then Andre, let's, let's switch to you for a moment. The, what was I mean? I, I've known you for a while now. What was your? But I don't think we've ever really dived deep into your background. Can you enlighten us on? The story of you? <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> I was also born and raised in Kyiv. I went uh, to school in Kyiv. 
if you have the same question for me, like you did to Yuri, sure. like you had to Yuri. Then I went to university in Ukraine. It is a uh, national uh, Taras Shevchenko University. Maybe you know that, maybe you mm -hmm. don't, but it's like- I, I, know, I know the name. I, I haven't had the pleasure of being there, but it's pretty famous. Yeah, it is, it is quite famous. I uh, was studying at mathematical fa facility there and specializing in uh, statistics. Okay. And uh, around second year of my bachelor, I decided to look more into IT. And we had there next to our campus, we had uh, these uh, courses that were supported by Cisco, which is a San Francisco company specializing in networking and switching. And yep. I had an opportunity to join them. And uh, that is basically how I got really into IT, IT. So I started looking into networking, I finished first course, got the first certificate, went working for a company there, and then I went to the second one, and then I felt that I probably should move from engineering to sales, which happened somewhere around 2006. Now, and let me interrupt for a second. That's a, that's a big change. It's, it's usually two different personality sets that are associated with both of those activities. So what, what prompted you to do something so dramatic? I, I felt that I enjoy being part of the communication process and business development. And also for me, the process of selling something was more appealing because uh, while you can work with the hardware and you, you don't get there the percentage like when you sell something. Uh, mm -hmm. Look, I will try to rephrase that somehow. I was 20 years old. I really needed money. And when I first uh, sold like the first batch of equipment, I think I received like 3% out of the whole deal. And the deal was somewhere around uh, 100K. And it was three grand for me. By the time that has been hell of a money, it's been a lot of money. I like at that year, I bought my first car. And I really felt that I want to be closer to money, closer to financial things going here and there than just engineering and adjusting work. And uh, because of that, I decided that I actually need a completely different sort of education because statistics mm -hmm. was definitely not helping and Cisco courses either. So I applied to several universities in the UK and I joined uh, in 2006, end of the year, I joined uh, the master's program at Warwick Business School in the okay. UK, near Coventry. You probably know that. Maybe I know, I know Coventry, very good. Okay, so yeah, it is there in the area. And uh, there I got master's in information systems management, which was much closer to what I was actually doing, right? Yeah. Management and sales. And yeah, that's probably how it all started. And crypto, I came to crypto 2015, uh, because by the time I've been selling a lot of equipment for data centers. And mm -hmm. then Matvey Sivaraksha, you probably know him personally too, he told mm -hmm. me about mining and I felt like, hey, this is the same data center, but the revenues are much higher. So we started building data uh, mining facilities around Ukraine and we've been selling all the crypto we mined. It is said right now when I log into my Poloniex account and we mined to Poloniex mostly and we mm -hmm. sold there either like straightforward. And I see those batches of transactions like, I don't know, 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sorry, so, buddy. <laughs> for, for 10 bucks or something and i see the history of those transactions yeah i sometimes regret doing that but it is what it is right it is what it is but you know i i wonder if that kind of of experience can be applied in the present or whether it was just like a moment of opportunity that doesn't reappear i, I get a little frustrated because i i bought bitcoin and i have it enough that makes life interesting but I could have done more and every Bitcoin I've ever sold, I've regretted it. So, but you know, it, it's like, you know, but I, I think, I think the way you address that is you, you take your, you take your hits and you keep on building something new. And of course, you know, the, the idea behind the show would be to explore the new thing you're building. And, you know, you can just think what, when it's a massive success, you can just take what happened before as the learning experience and hopefully just a rounding error in the big pictures. So, there's an expression I like, which is explain it to me like I'm five years old. So explain it to me like I'm five years old 
again, Albridge, what, what is the need that it's solving? What's the problem that it's solving? And then we'll go into the exact details of how it's solving it. So just kind of kind of retread over that for me, if you don't mind. Should, should it be me or it's Yuri's? Uh... Uh, you know, you, you guys are a team. I mean, as you see fit. You can argue over each other if you want. I just felt that I've been talking for long. And I know myself, I can continue talking all the time. And that would be, you know, uh, maybe. I, I, I think you have a very accurate self-perception, but in this case, it's okay to start off. So please do us the honor. Okay. I can explain like for, for a 14 year old. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, we'll start with a five-year-old. And then we'll, then we'll when, once I say got it, we'll go take it to the 40-year-old level. So Andre, do, it, do the five-year-old version, then we'll do yours 40-year-old version. Okay. There are multiple blockchains in the world. Each blockchain is something like a city. People live in the city, they go to work, they go back to home, they're involved in a variety of activities. And some cities are better for some activities than the others. For instance, I don't know, restaurants in Kiev are cheaper than they are in New York, on average. You would probably agree with that one, right? So yes. if you want to get cheaper food, then I would suggest you go to Kiev rather than to New York. Now, on the other hand, if you prefer maybe some high quality- so what, If I want sushi, I go to Michelin Tokyo. Restaurants, you cannot find Michelin restaurant in Kiev. So you will be probably looking for another city to go. And to move from city to city, if we are not taking the New York as an extreme example, which is somewhere in America and we are in Ukraine, let's take something closer to us, maybe Vienna or whatsoever, you will be driving in a car. And when you stop driving on the awful Ukrainian roads and you encounter those high quality highways in Europe, you will start paying for using them, right? Mm -hmm. You're yes. buying those tickets to be able to use the roads, uh, the toll roads, of course. And this is what we do. We build toll roads. We charge fees for people who are driving from blockchain A to blockchain B. Does okay. it sound like a good answer. Five years old? Yes, I, that was good. But the five-year-old of me is happy. Okay, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a brain upgrade, or maybe at least I'll do a brain getting order. I don't know if it's an upgrade. And then Yuri, talk to me like I'm Talk to me like I'm 52. Uh, well, uh, my, my analogy is shorter, I think. So uh, like instead of different cities, imagine different countries and like they have their own banking systems. They have, they have their own currencies. They have, they have their own rules. And uh, like there is no problem if you pay within the same country for, for goods and services. Uh, but uh, imagine the world without uh, Visa, MasterCard, or SWIFT transfers, uh, where you can only pay like within the same country. But then a uh, company like Oldbridge comes. So basically, we are the Visas and MasterCards and SWIFTs of the world of blockchain. Uh, we enable uh, asset transfers from one banking system, one blockchain, to another banking system, another blockchain. So that's that's essentially what we do. Fair enough. And then, how long? How far along is the technology? It is working. Is it, is it working at scale? Uh, sure. Like we we don't have like millions of transactions, uh, but I was looking at our stats. We yeah. By the way, uh, the dashboard, this public stats is coming very soon uh but we have like 20 30 thousand transactions per week uh through our bridge and uh, this uh, translates like to 100 mil weekly uh dollars and that's the slow weeks around christmas uh right. so yeah people are using it it's very popular um so there, there is a demand and we are well sadly we are just one of bridge uh, of, because there are other bridges as well and like we we are trying to offer uh, some unique features so the users work with us like andre mentioned in the beginning that we are uh 
not many blockchains are working with EVM and non-EVM. Uh, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. not many bridges work with EVM and non-EVM chains. And that's what, what we are considering our specialty. And that's why we, uh, we talked uh, with Casper uh, for identity support and, and other uh, blockchains which are uh, typically overlooked by typical bridges. Uh, that's, that's why we are called all bridge. We, we want to bridge all. Oh, interesting. Now, let, let me ask you, I'm going to bring up the name of what a possible competitor is. P putting to one side the EVM, non-EVM distinction, is Chainlink a competitor? Uh, no, Chainlink is doing something different. Uh, it's like basically if uh, we are talking about the uh, analogy with banking system, Chainlink is, I think it's like uh, FedEx, basically. Uh, uh, it's, it's transferring all, all the stuff. It, it, it can transfer uh, parcels, it can transfer mail, it can transfer uh, money as well. Uh, so Chainlink is doing something different. Uh, okay. Then who, who are you competing with? Sorry, in the pure EVM space, and we'll get to the, I think your, your innovative idea of linking EVM and not EVM is something I want to explore more, but in the pure EVM native space, who's, who's, who are your competitors? Uh, let me think. Uh, Andre, maybe you have something. I can help. The tip of your tongue, yeah, but because the, it is I, I was, yeah, I'm so, so, so in our stuff. So I forgot about all the competitors. It is okay. I, I think about them all the time, even when I'm sleeping, I see them in my sleep, you know, in my nightmares, those big guys like multi, multi-chain, right? Who all right, multi -chain. finalized 60 mil round and has Binance behind them. Then I should probably mention uh, Synapse. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, we're still somewhere in the EVM area. Then there is Optics Bridge, for instance, that uh, gets a lot of liquidity from Ether to Celo, which is quite popular. Uh, there are each and every blockchain natively has its own bridge, like Avalanche has its bridge, Harmony has its yeah. bridge. So they all have their own bridge, but it is usually from Ether to their blockchain. So it is not really a big competitor for us. And then who else do we have in mind? Multi-chain. Yeah? Multi-chain. Yeah, multi-chain. I started with multi-chain. X, uh, how were they called before? A any swap? No, uh, no it, uh, oh, it, it's okay. So sense, these uh, are sort of the big dogs that you're taking on. And if I heard you correctly, it, it, you made an interesting point, which is most EVM compatible chains have a sort of native bridge between the Ethereum network and themselves. But, yes. they, but sort of this poly network uh, bridging is something that is more specialized, more unique. And there's companies out there that are doing that. Some of them are uh, more or less so, associated with certain blockchain. Some of them are raising capital and you're, you're the scrappy competitor taking them on is what it sounds like. <laughs> I see your expression. He, 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 I think it was vaguely. I don't. I don't want to be a scrappy competitor. No. <laughs> well, you, maybe for the moment, you know. Do, do, I, I, I will. I will probably identify multi-chain as uh, as the strongest bridge in the EVM landscape. They are focused solely on EVM, and I'm not sure if we can even really compete with them because they cover most of the chains. Uh, that uh, are similar to Ether. Uh, they have a lot of liquidity and a lot of projects work with them. So yeah, uh, multi-chain would probably be the largest and the most problematic. But the good news here is that we are not only doing EVM chains, we are also doing non-EVM chains. And there, the situation gets much better. Right, so all right. So let, let, me, kind of, let me serve that up and then I'll pass it to you. So just for the audience, just full disclosure, I've been involved directly or indirectly with the Casper blockchain for a couple of years now. And I'm presently an advisor there. So I'm just letting my bias show, but I'm, I became an advisor to them as opposed to other blockchains because I see some unique value proposition in what they're working to accomplish. I also see that they're deeply involved in the MENA region uh, and in Dubai, which is of course where I'm not at the moment, but in general situated. So I, I 
I've had the pleasure of working with the Casper team, their board, their advisors. I'm also with the developers DAO, the DevX DAO, which is a DAO that supports developers. It's, it's blockchain agnostic, but it was nice enough of Casper to sort of fund its grant pool with a very large donation of tokens. And you know, we've had the pleasure of you know, entertaining in a grant application from Allbridge that got approved. And we're, we're looking forward to working with you. And you know, the, it, was, it was neat to see the grant application that brought you to my awareness that there was an interaction happening and here we are you know, on YouTube. So I like how everything works out. Now, explain, I, I think you've identified a very interesting market niche to get out sort of the EVM ghetto, and I'm using that with air quotes, and, and really become an Allbridge. Now I understand your name a little bit more. Can you describe how you identified that niche, how you decided the best, you know, why you decided the niche was relevant, and then how you're specifically addressing it? I will probably give a short intro and let you retake it from there. Sure. When we started, we were starting with Solana. So we breached Ether, BC, and Hobby Chain. I think that was the first version of the breach to Solana. Mm -hmm. And by that time, there have been only one competitor bridging to Solana, Wormhole, official breach from them. But a, it hasn't been really working very well at that time. It didn't even, I think, have UI at the moment we started working on the bridge. And then uh, it focused solely on Ether. So we have seen that there are a lot of bridges out there in the world. And we tried to find those chains that are not yet connected. For us, our business really exploded when we breached Polygon to Solana. I will give you an example. If you go- you Bridge on... Polygon to Solana. Okay, that's interesting. When you, when you go to Polygon, when you go to QuickSwap, which is the largest AMM on Polygon, and you will trade Sol on Polygon, it is gonna be the Sol that we breached. So the Solana itself appeared on Polygon thanks to us. And I think that was uh, the moment of revelation when we understood that there are those chains in the world that are just not yet connected. And if we connect them, we will see a lot of traffic moving here and there. Look. I've seen transactions when we made the integration from Solana to Polygon, I've seen 50 million of dollars transferred in one single transaction. That's a oh, lot great. of money. That's fantastic. Yeah, and we made 25 cents of it. <laughs> yeah, because we, we need to Sorry, but in, in a way that's fantastic also. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, probably, yeah, I think it, it should be your turn right now because he understands much more about how all those things work under the Here, yeah, yeah uh, I, I don't want to get into the, all the dirty details right away. Uh, but yes, basically bridging EVMs, it's like, okay, we have a bridge on one side and the bridge on the other side is a, basically a copy of the bridge on the first side. So like uh, uh, adding new chains is basically copy paste of everything you've already done on Ethereum. Uh, so that's why there are so many EVM, uh, EVM only bridges. And uh, when we go out of the EVM world uh, to, to new and exciting blockchains, like each one of them has its own quirks and quirks and features, so to speak, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, because why why is Solana so like so so interesting? Because it's it's quite hard to develop smart contracts on Solana. Uh, you have to know a lot of stuff. You have to know have a, a lot of experience. So I had the privilege of working on with uh, directly with Solana core team on some of the smart contracts. Yeah, you, basically you can see my commits to to the repo and. Uh, got me insight on how they're working. Um, Great. Uh, I've been working with uh, Cosmos and Terra also before, so that's helped us uh, develop Terra contract because look, every every new chain has, has its own stuff. And it's very, very, uh, it's, responsibility is quite, quite big when you're not simply writing an, uh, like an application on one chain, uh, I mean, smart contract application. 
uh, mm -hmm. because uh, if it's only one chain, the blockchain helps you. Uh, you it, like, it does not allow you to do the double spending or conflicting transactions and so on and so forth. And when we are doing the bridge, uh, we basically have to guarantee the finality on one chain before we issue funds on another chain. And to do this, we need to know all the particular details about each of those blockchains. Oh, you know what? That's interesting because you just made me realize, I mean, in the, just back when I was studying databases, this idea of, you know, Adam, like, you know, right, you can't roll it back because it's the blockchain. Yeah. So yeah. You, you really, it really needs to be fully committed on one before you go to the other one. But what if it doesn't fully commit on the other one? How do you adjust on the original? Or is that, does that question uh, even make sense? No, that's, that's it. Uh, uh, if, if it's not final on one, on one side and we issue the funds on another side, that's it. We, we printed money out of nothing. And like, uh, we, like, for example, uh, for example, on the Polygon, uh, forks of uh, blocks, up to 100 blocks are quite common. So on Ethereum, like a fork on two blocks, it's 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 already a large fork. Uh, but on uh, you you can check on on the Polygon uh, Explorer that there are like 20, 30, 50, 60 blocks forks, and like each if we uh, fork is meaning like if if you if you don't know the details for the viewers, uh, fork mean that that uh, not the database a blockchain had to roll back. Yeah, of course. this number of blocks and start again. So if we would consider transaction final in one of those forks, it didn't basically didn't happen uh, in, in reality. We considered it happened, but it didn't happen. Another example was uh, Solana blockchain basically shutting down for like almost a day. It was a couple of months ago. Uh, like there was a spam attack and it was working slower, 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 and it shut down. Yep. And it was, was, was quite a rough night for me uh, because yeah, we were wondering what we considered final and where will they roll? Well, because they, they announced, okay, uh, the blockchain has stopped. We will roll it back and restart it. So the question was, where do they roll it back? Because Solana has almost instant finality. Uh, so we rely on that to, to guarantee our finality. And I'm sorry, if, I, I got it. I mean, I, I, was aware, I was aware of when that happened. It was news. Isn't there ability to roll it back? I hate to do this, a sign of centralization. Are you, are you comfortable with this? Um, well, Solana is kind of centralized. Uh, like, uh, because like all the validator, all the large validators, I, I, I've been on the uh, validator uh, Discord uh, this night, and like basically validators were sitting and saying, "Dev team, help us. What should we do?" And Dev team said, "Okay, update to this version. Okay, roll back to this block. Okay, start again." So right now Solana depends on the on the development team uh, quite a lot and basically they control what's going on I don't know if it's a controversial opinion or not uh, but yeah that's that's how it is uh, and basically that's what happened uh, the blockchain was rolled back to to the block like when when it was quite slow and uh, that that's what helped us because uh, this block was already when we could not access uh, blockchain information from the nodes because they are very slow. Okay, so, uh, so let, let me pause you a second. So going forward, taking into account what happened that rough night, but knowing that stuff like this, that you got an inherent issue because the, okay, if we presuppose that in general, blockchain transactions are, you know, achieve finality and then become irreversible, irreversible. We assume that's the general case, barring, development teething exceptions like what Solana had, but just go, you know, like Bitcoin, I think it's pretty much assumed to be that at this point. How do you safely bridge two blockchains if you need finality on one before you go to the other one? 
Well, we basically do what other centralized, not others, but what, what the centralized exchanges do. When you deposit your funds to any centralized exchange, you will see it waiting for the number of confirmation. So that's what our validators do. Uh, they look for the number of confirmations and the, this depends on the particular blockchain. And like, basically when, when that number of confirmations reached on the centralized exchanges, you have this uh, amount you deposited available for trading. And uh, okay. in our case, you have this amount available for bridging to another chain. And do you have your own validator network or is this built into the smart contracts somehow? Or who's actually uh, mandating well, them a matter of wait time? Uh, we built our own validators and currently we are running the networks ourselves. Uh, and But the smart contracts are controlling some stuff too. Uh, they prevent double spending because uh, basically we, can, we, we, we need to build like a, a double spending prevention model uh, working across chains. Uh, so we need, we, we had to introduce our own identification, uh, cross chain identification model for each transaction. So we have like transaction ID, which is unique across all the chains mm -hmm. and, and smart contracts on each blockchain, uh, check if they already process this unique ID. And yeah, this ID has really has to be unique and sending blockchain checks is if it's unique, receiving blockchain check is unique and, and yeah, so on and so forth. So some work uh, is done by off-chain validators and some work is done by smart contracts. Okay, and, and then what is your, it sounds like you're in the process of decentralizing the validator validation of function. What, what's your economic model for incenting others to, to become validators? uh they will have they will receive the share of the fees uh we've got like basically currently we have uh, the staking program where rewards are going coming from the fees of sure. our bridge and uh, but when we will be uh decentralizing uh the the validator network these rewards will be shared with validators as well Got it. Uh, and if, I'm, I'm going to ask you a slightly tough question. Uh, when Andre mentioned that, like, I think 50 million of value got transferred between chains, you somewhat smirkingly said yes, and we made a whole $25 off of that. 25, is, cents. That, 25, oh, 25 cents off that. Oh, okay. It was really, really good. Good night for you. Um, is there enough revenue available in the network to properly incentivize a sufficient mass of validators so that it can become decentralized? Uh, not with 25 cents, of course. Uh, and yeah, you, 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 you heard the number of transactions from me earlier and you could multiply in your head and have like, okay, it's $500 or what? Uh, who will be running validators for this money? Uh, no, we've, uh, since then, we've changed the model of how we um, charge users for transfers. So basically now we have a flat fee. Uh, we is not 25 cents, but 50 cents for each transfer. But we also mm -hmm. have a 0.3% fee from the amount transfer. But okay. this, uh, this amount can be reduced if you stake our token. So uh, basically, if you're transferring uh, 100K uh, USD from one chain to another, you will pay $300 uh, in fees uh, if you like, don't do anything. But if you stake our token, mm -hmm. is the more you stake, the more this fee will be reduced. So basically, like you have, if you stake five hundred dollars in our token, uh, mm -hmm. the fee goes down to fifty cents. Okay, now I'm gonna ask a complete neophyte question. Uh, I always get tripped up, tripped up, and the people I work with get tripped up by the existence of USDT on Ethereum and also on Tron. And it's, it seems like it's two little bubble worlds that really is inconvenient because we all want to work in USDT, or maybe USDC sometimes, but we've got two, two different chains and the fees seem to, on Ethereum seem to be rather high when you're doing USDT transactions. So I'm always having people say, can I pay you using the Tron network? Is Albridge a way of addressing that issue and seamlessly moving your USDT back and forth between those two chains? Uh, not really. 
<laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, like I, I, I need uh, to give a small background about the all, all, all these different USDTs we have in existence because um, you're you're completely right. Like uh, the USDT on Ethereum and Tron are completely different. They're not connected. They're well, they are connected, but they are connected by an off-chain entity, by the tether itself. Yes. Uh, so they like okay, we mint this amount in Ethereum, or we mint this amount in Tron. That's up to them. They have the control. They mint whatever they want. They have some kind of way to to tell okay, that's that's somehow backed by this amount of, of actual dollars on our accounts. But yeah, you know the problem with audits and stuff like that. Um, well, that's one kind. Uh, similar situation with USDC, but of course, uh, a little bit more uh, transparent. They also issue their own tokens on different platforms. So like we have USDC on Ethereum, on uh, on Solana, on uh, on Avalanche, and actually on Avalanche, uh, Avalanche Seas Chain, there is a very interesting situation with USDC because uh, there are many USDCs on Avalanche. And mm -hmm. Example are two main ones. Uh, the first one is USDC.e, which is Ethereum USDC bridged yeah. to Avalanche uh, okay. by, by the official Avalanche bridge. So they have Ethereum USDC locked on Ethereum and USDC.e minted on Avalanche. And there is an official USDC on Avalanche. So uh, minted by Circle and it's called USDC, just USDC. And it's also there. So uh, which one is better? Uh, I would say USDC.e simply because it has like 10 or 100 times more total supply and more transactions and more liquidity in it uh, on, on Avalanche than the official one. So you see the, 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 <laughs> the conflict here, the paradox that uh, the bridge token is, is better essentially than the native token and uh, yeah. basically yeah basically that's how our bridge works as well when we bridge tokens to another chain we lock liquidity on the original token on the original chain and we mint our own token uh, and then we need to uh, like basically legitimize this token people have to use it so that's why we usually provide uh, uh, liquidity with our AMM partners on, uh, on different chains, uh, which allow them to swap the tokens we minted to any other token uh, they need. So for example, uh, we bridge uh, USDC from Ethereum to Solana. And there is already USDC on Solana. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do we accomplish it? We, we, we print our own USDC? Essentially, yes. We print our token, which we call AE USDC, AE meaning all bridge Ethereum USDC. Uh, but the users don't have to keep it or, 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 or do something with it. They can immediately swap it to USDC because there is a, a liquidity on Sabre, uh, which basically it's one to one exchange. So they have official USDC from one side, official USDC on another side. And that's it. And in, in between, we mint our own token. So uh, we also have uh, a supply of USDC token in Solana created by us and, and on other chains as well. This is a fascinating project. And there, I can see the, the layers of complexity. I mean, you have, a, you have a heterogeneous set of networks, each with their own nuances. Yet you sort of have a combinatorial problem also or challenge. Uh, well, I, I, um... We try, we try to build our architectures not, not to have it. Yeah, understand what you mean. We try like to have like uh, when the bridge, uh, the, when the blockchains are coming to bridge, well, they're not coming. But you can imagine this diagram with different blockchains and the bridge in the middle. Like bridge works with them as, as like they're all the same for us. So that's why we can uh, provide the, uh, Reach to any direction. Okay. Any blockchain to any blockchain. So, because when funds are uh, considered by the validator as locked, 
uh, it does not matter on the receiving site where they were locked. Okay, so there's a lot of abstraction there. Interesting. Yes. yes. Okay, fascinating. Uh, all right, so th this, this we could go on for hours on this. And I, I kind of want to, but let, let's shift to what, what, what was the again on bias towards Casper. What was the Casper moment or attraction, or how did that come to pass? Mm, Andre, uh, <clears throat> we <clears throat> we first met. Wait, Andre, was it was it you and me meeting in the airport lounge in Dubai? Yeah, I think, I, think uh, <laughs> I think after we met in the airport lounge yeah. in Kiev, by the way, not in Dubai, in Kiev, we met Thank in you. Kiev. Yes, I was flying to Lisbon, and uh, in that lounge, you asked me where is the bridge to Casper. <laughs> I think I asked you, and where is the grant from Casper? Yeah, and uh, you sort of said it's not going to be a problem because before we met with uh, Mark uh, during BIP 001 mm -hmm. in Odessa, and we discussed yeah. that we can do the Casper Bridge, but things were not really, you know, moving on from there. And after I came back from Lisbon, I pinged in our Casper group everyone. I think I even I've got on this call with uh, the guys that are developing an AMM on Casper, mm -hmm. and they asked me, oh, "What is the like? Why we are waiting for something?" I said that yeah, we are waiting for the grant, but we are not exactly sure how we should get this grant. Like, what is the mm -hmm. process? I do remember I even texted you like, "Hey, uh, Gordon, we are ready to do. What is the next steps?" You said that you will circle back. And then yep. uh, this conversation with the AMM guys happened. And then they invited me on a call with uh, a couple of people from Casper. And they said, look, this is relatively easy. Here is the application form. Fill it in. We will review it. We filled it in. They made some sort of adjustments. Uh, then we uploaded it to the DevX DAO. And uh, I think that informal vote went pretty quickly. Yep. And 90 something percent of it was in our side. But then we were stuck at KYC. By stuck, I mean, I was not receiving a link for KYC. And then after being stuck at KYC and after receiving the link, I submitted my docs. Then we were stuck at compliance process, which I'm not even exactly sure what was happening behind the scenes. So I pinged people in the group. I think I wrote an email, something like. I mean, the, 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 the short version, I'll, and I'll save this on YouTube forever, is there's this there's an avalanche of compliance stuff. You know, I, I saw that you were involved. I'm like, oh, got to jump on this one, and I, cleared it. I, I was I was not even sure what I should do when I'm like pending compliance phase. Uh, I haven't. Been Don't committed. commit any crimes. Okay, I try not to. Wait, 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 wait but you know, but, but what I meant was while you're feeling the form, yeah. Don't commit any more crimes. The, you know, there's a, a, Andre, starting uh, now. Huh? Starting, starting now. Starting now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep, keep, keep your nose clean. But though, I mean, what is the, I mean, it may be premature to ask this, but I'll, if it is, let me know. But what is, what, what is the challenge? What is the benefit? What is the use case for the Casper Bridge? It, it's interesting. I, I, I'm circling back to the idea that you're, you're neat because you do EVM and non EVM. And this seems to be a case of that. The, is, is there any specific nuance here you want to explore? Is it, is it too early to ask that question? And I, just I, will, I will just mention one key thing about our bridge. You will see why it is important. Whenever sure. we add one more chain, we connect it to all the chains we have. That means- Okay, so I, I, I get, get a perfect network effect. If we add Casper yeah. tomorrow, the bridge mm -hmm. to Casper be not only live from Ether, which I think there is a bridge from Ether to Casper. But for instance, mm -hmm. in a single package, you will get any asset you want to see on Casper from Terra, from Solana, from you know all those chains that are not yet bridged to Casper. So there would be a possibility of flowing, uh, of liquidity flowing from here to there. And liquidity flowing means that the t value is increasing and increasing t value is good. Yes. Yes. That's a beautiful, that's a great, yeah. That's... TVL is good, yeah. <laughs> TVL is good. Uh, uh, well, uh, I want to add just, just a small, uh, uh, basically, uh, we, we asked the question, uh, like, okay, guys, can you bring, build the bridge? And we say, is there an AMM on, on Casper? 
And at the moment, there was none. I like to. I, th I think you probably I'm talked to David Ty and Captain Bernardo. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but that guys. was like the, the back, back in, uh, in the summer uh, mm -hmm. last year. And uh, that's basically like a chicken and egg problem uh, because you need a bridge to bring liquidity and you need AMM to swap liquidity. So yes. uh, there is not much liquidity on AMM without the bridge and there is no need to build the bridge if there is no AMM. So uh, that's why we need like to, 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 to meet in the middle somewhere uh, we, we, with the chains without of which are only starting. Um, like we had the similar situation on Aurora, I think, but yeah, we were uh, a little bit slower. So there was already an MM ecosystem there. And yeah, so now we, I think we are, we are good to go and uh, Fantastic. There will be challenges on the way, but uh, I think we're in much better shape than uh, half a year ago. And, and when, when can we expect the Albridge Bridge to Casper to be functional? Mm. This is a question to Yuri, but before we <laughs> dive into that, I would say that first, probably the formal vote on grants should pass. And I'm not exactly sure how long it may take. Do we have any? I, I, I will push it because I, I love you guys and this is a good project. So after formal grant, after, sorry, I was moving to notification out of the way. So I, after we jam through the formal vote, I, I'm not holding you to it. I'm just roughly, for, for the people who are excited by what you just said um, and the idea of, of bridging from Casper to all these other networks, um, is it safe to say within six months? Uh, it I is. would say earlier, up to three months. Fantastic. Uh, Maybe less. Mm, I'm just trying to be conservative. Uh, let's say spring. Okay. I like it. Fantastic. Um, and, and then where, where do you see taking, going back to your company and your platform in general, where do you see it a year from now? What, 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 if, you, if, if everything goes the way you're planning and you bring this goodness around, what's, what's the state of the world in early 2023? It's, you know, I will start answering now and my words will make Yuri sad because he, every time he gets sad when I start uh, talking about all those things that we need to implement. But let's start with that. All major chains are connected. All the security audits has been passed. Most of the code where it is okay to do is open sourced. And that yes. is just part one. Now, part two, the decentralization for validators. So the bridge uh, operates in fully decentralized way. Uh, this is probably important part two. Important part three, which uh, should also be developed uh, along with those processes, it is uh, better, easier to use UI, better user experience, all those sort of things when you don't need to do two transactions sending and receiving, but better one. Uh, the possibility to get guest token on the destination chains and all other cool things, uh, which uh, will make the life of our users easier. All that, hopefully, Yuri, are you with me? Until end of summer. No, no. No. <laughs> no. But ho hopefully, hopefully until end of summer. And then we uh, get into another important part is working on SDK so that projects would be using our bridge as infrastructure layer, integrating it within their own business processes, which are sort of cool because I think that the bridges are right now working, you know, as a separated UI where people just come to use the bridge. It is not exactly right. People should have their business, you know, what, what they want, they want something on the business side. They don't want br bridge as a, just a bridge. They want to get yields. They want to explore different blockchains, different market opportunities, and they need to use the bridge to get there, to get what they want. And instead of uh, routing everyone to a single UI, we should act like, uh, like an infrastructure, providing other DApps a possibility to use our bridge under the hood. And after that, I'm really keen on integrating cross-chain swaps because Bridge right now, it is uh, transferring the asset to its you know, own representation on the other chain. So we take right. USDC on Ether, we get USDC on Solana. 
what if we could take ether on ether and then with the help of the bridge buy with usdc sold on solana putting it all in in one uh, thing so cross chain swaps is definitely something cool to explore other cool ideas involve cross chain lending when uh, again you can take your ether lock your ether on ether get usdc on solana and buy soul and you, we keep this ETH as a collateral but still you are not saying bye bye to your uh, you know to your ETH. you can roll it all back i love it have you have you looked at wise at all look at wise w-i-s-e peter gers bond like platform uh i will look into it yeah, just when, you, when you, they, they, they have an interesting lending functionality also, and there, I think there may be some benefit bridging to them. So we've, all bridge can also bridge to WISE, perhaps, because they're working with Casper as well. So just a possibility. I'll throw it out there. I will take a look. Fantastic. Uh, this sounds like an amazing project. Uh, I, think we're, I think we're closing up on the time, but we'll, we'll put in the show notes um, the project website, the if you have and just any other resources you feel like sharing and then other people can follow up with you and if you can we'll put your linkedin or you know telegram group or just whatever is appropriate and i'm i'm very happy that we can reinitiate this video series talking to the two of you yuri i i think you participated more than than i than i was told i think you got a little bit into the conversation is that, is that reasonably fair to say yeah when i start answering questions I, it's kind of hard to stop me that's there you go. That's a good quality. <laughs> maybe and, maybe Yuri wants to add something to the feature list for the for this year. I described anything else you want to de develop. Meanwhile, uh, you know me, I do very well. I I want to 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 uh, make less features, but make them better. Uh, yeah. So that's what what Andre said. It's very much our roadmap. Uh, not sure if we will get everything done in in this year. So it's like for a couple of years ahead, um, yeah. but yeah, we're getting there. Yeah, it, it sounds like an amazing project. And you guys have already made a huge amount of progress. So, I, and I can see the potential. But anyways, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the recording. Put on my little glasses so I can actually see the screen here. Uh, stop.